Hello, look, I'm thrilled that you can come to help me launch my new book called Loving Animals on Bestiality, Zoophilia and Post-Human Love, published by the incredible Reaction Books. Now, this book has actually been really long in the making. It fuses my interests in violence, in sex and sexuality, in the history of psychiatry, and what it means to be human, which is a book I wrote a few years ago about encounters between human and non-human animals. But I think Loving Animals is also a departure from uh, my previous work, because as well as reflecting on boundary breaches, violence, apocalyptic futures, I also seek to address questions of love and interconnectedness. Now, no one can deny that most encounters between human and non-human animals involve harm. We admire exotic wildlife while destroying their habitats. We are distressed by the unkind treatment of animals, but we regulate their slaughter in abattoirs. Western lifestyles are wholly dependent upon farming animals, which involve practices of extraordinary cruelty. Philosopher Jacques Derrida invented a term to describe human-animal relations. This is Carno phallogocentrism, a long word, but it's actually easy if you break it down. In other words, it means our treatment of animals is based on privileging masculine traits, fellow, the possession of language, logos, and it involves a willingness to kill and to eat other sentient beings, carno. But I think it's also important not to deny that many of us sincerely love our animals. We call them pets. In fact, pet ownership probably goes back to Paleolithic times. And today, between 45% and 70% of British and American homes shelter a companion species. Half of all pets sleep in the same bed with a member of the human family. We maintain fict fictive kin relationships with them. We kiss, we caress them. What we don't have is have sex with them. At least most of us don't. Sex with animals is one of the last taboos, the final bastion of human exceptionalism. The prohibition of what is sometimes called bestiality, distinguishes the human subject from the animal object. One question I ask in Loving Animals, therefore, is, well, why is sex with animals such a taboo? While all other arguments about human exceptionalism have been dismantled, bestiality remains off limits at least in practice, and just as a little footnote here, you know, animal human sex is everywhere. If you look at art, or if you look at literature, you just have to think of cave paintings from 8,000 BC, to Leda and the Swan, 1750, to Oshima's Max Mon Amour, um, 1986, starring Charlotte Rampling, to Albies, the goat, who is Sylvia, not to mention, of course, Woody Allen's everything you always wanted to know about sex, but were afraid to ask. It's only in very recent years that some people have begun to undermine the absolute prohibition on zoo sexuality. Are the arguments of zoo sexuals dangerous? Perverted? Or simply wrong-headed? Or are we entering a new and more amorous phase in human-animal relations? Instead of asking about sexuality, should we be asking about love? And what does it mean to love non-human animals? More pertinently, what does it mean to love? So this is what loving animals explores the modern history of human sexual encounters with other species. However, British and American commentators talked about 
sex with animals and what changing meanings have been attached to the concepts or the words bestiality or zoophilia. I am curious about debates about whether people who are sexually attracted to non-human animals are psychiatrically ill. Do they have a paraphilia, a psychiatric term combining the Greek preface para, meaning besides, with philia, meaning love? Or are they just normal people who happen to have a minority sexual orientation? Given the fraught debates about consent in human-on-human sexual encounters, it is, I think, worth, worth asking whether non-human animals can ever consent to libidinal relations with humans. Clearly, sexual intercourse between different species is often harmful. Many critics argue that it is, by definition, abusive. I actually don't think I agree. This is not, by the way, to justify bestiality. After all, just because something is not inherently violent or harmful does not mean that it is acceptable. This book maintains that we need to think really carefully about what we mean when we use complex concepts like consent or sex. This is partly why I believe that exploring human animal love can also help us reflect on love between humans. And ethics of animal loving can contribute to debates about human as well as non-human desires. As these comments probably are making clear, I am no fan of arguments based on human exceptionalism. The fundamental premise of this book is that bestiality is not an affront to the dignity of man. Neither does it degrade people below the level of animals, as the philosopher Kant decreed. Philosopher Peter Morris even argues that bestiality is regarded by many people as distasteful, not because it degrades animals, but because it upgrades them. It treats them as something better than they are. In contrast, I see no problem in upgrading non-human animals. Kant believed that um, humans possess an inherent dignity, but I suggest that non-human animals do it as well. Indeed, non-human animals possess invaluable rights to have their interests and their preferences respected. They do not exist to serve human ends. Their lives their happiness matters to them, as do ours. But first, what about religion and the law? It will come as no surprise that entrenched religious prohibitions have not only governed attitudes towards human-animal sexual intercourse, but also informed the law. Like other forms of non-reproductive sex, such as homosexuality and queer sex, Human-animal intercourse has been universally condemned by religious leaders. Judo-Christian texts denounce bestiality as a major sin. Leviticus 18 verses 22 to 24 states that humans defile, defile themselves when they lie with any beast. Leviticus 20 verses 15 and 16 reiterates the point insisting that a man or woman who has sexual intercourse with any beast shall surely be put to death, and he shall slay the beast. In legal terms, bestiality has usually been subsumed under legislation prohibiting buggery or non-reproductive sex. No distinction was made between buggery between two men or between a man and an animal. However, prior at least to the 16th century, the crime of buggery was not harshly punished. This changed in 1533 with the passing of the Buggery Act, which outlawed the detestable and abominable vice of buggery committed with mankind or beast. Bestial acts were so offensive that the penalty was death. 
and not simply of the human bestialist, but also of the animal. It was considered relevant that the animal responded to human advances and therefore was not a passive victim or simply an object of human lusts. This help explain, helps explain, I think, why there were strong taboos associated with animals who had been sexually active with humans. They could not be eaten, for example, nor could their milk be drunk. Sometimes this was because they were regarded as having been polluted. But other times it was suggested that they had in fact been humanized, making eating them actually a form of cannibalism. The assumption that animals could be agents in sexual encounters was expressed in other ways as well. Animals might even be hauled into court so that judges could see whether by his or her behavior, the offensive acts had taken place. Let me give you an example. Mary Hicks, she was a married woman living in a working class area of Cripplegate. 1677, she was brought before London Central Criminal Court and accused of having sex with a dog. Unfortunately for her, when the dog was set on the bar before the prisoner, he proved the allegation by wagging his tail and making motions as it were to kiss her, which twas sworn she did do when she made that horrid use of him. Both parties were found guilty and Hicks was forced to watch her dog being hanged before she too was executed. In Hicks's case, the dog was judged to be partly accountable for what had taken place. Other animals, however, were proclaimed innocent of the foul deed. In another trial, this time involving a man and a donkey, the neighbors signed statements attesting to the donkey's virtuous behavior and the fact that she had never given occasion for scandal. Unlike the man, the donkey was believed to have been a victim of bestial lusts rather than a participant and he was acquitted. Such views were a world away from current understandings in which animals are stripped of all agency and are therefore regarded as victims rather than co-conspirators. However, it is interesting that in the whole period from the 17th century to 1834, there were relatively few cases of bestiality prosecuted. From 1674, until 1834, only 11 cases appeared before the Old Bailey. Death was the penalty until 1861, when imprisonment became the main way of punishing offenders. Although the number of years that had to be served varied from just a few months to life. In religion and in law, Bestiality was viewed as a disruption of the God-ordained order that placed humans at the top of the hierarchy of beings, as well as being linked to theological anxieties, um, such as the fear that demons uh, were fond of appearing before humans in animal disguises, and, of course, pollution of the species. Bestial acts were regarded as much a sin as homosexuality and masturbation, and therefore could be more harshly punished if committed by a married as opposed to a single man. After the Second World War, however, you start seeing changes happening. The seriousness of the offence was progressively reduced. In Britain, the US and much of Europe, bestiality was increasingly removed from the list of felonies, appearing instead under legislation dealing with cruelty to animals, breach of the peace, trespass, damage to property, or offences to public decency. 
the decriminalization of male homosexuality from the 1960s had a major effect on legal attitudes to bestiality. In other words, when crimes against nature and sodomy were removed from the statute books, sex with animals was inadvertently also decriminalized. This was only really noticed from the 1990s. There were a series of major scandals about, about men having sex with animals. So bestiality had to be recriminalized. In the US, very few states designated bestiality a felony in uh, 1990. While by the start of the 21st century, 24 states had made it a felony, and by 2017, this had risen to 42 states. One of the problems and one of the reasons this legislation was so slow to be introduced is because legislators seeking to recriminalize bestiality had to ask, well, how do we differentiate bestiality from normal animal husbandry practices? For example, farmers had routinely used artificial insemination from the 1950s. Dairy farmers use a, what they call a rape rack to forcibly restrain cows while they're being impregnated by either by a bull or artificially. Humans um, engage in foreplay to arouse animals prior to insemination. The artificial insemination of pigs, for example, sometimes requires farmers to simulate mounting and fondling. Animals are spayed, neutered, castrated. They have their genitals restricted. They are kept constantly pregnant. Standard farming practices include the castration of pigs and the manual or electrical stimulation of the genitals of built bulls to collect semen. In other words, the difference between a bestialist and a farmer is a biopolitical one. The bestialist man manipulates the sex organs of animals in the interests of personal gratification. In contrast, farmers similarly manipulate the animal's sexual organs, but in the interests of capital production. The first act criminalized, the second promoted as necessary to economic growth. Legislators therefore had to be careful to frame their laws in ways that would not criminalize farmers. Well, anxieties about people who engage in sex with animals is huge. And it's not helped by the fact that actually we know very little about them, nearly Everyone who works in the field cites American sexologist Alfred Kingsey's extraordinary survey of 1948. He found that one, Ameri one adult American male in 12 to 14, that is 8%, claimed to have had a sexual encounter with an animal. In farming communities, he found that 17% had experienced orgasm as the result of animal contact, contact since their adolescence, that this statistic rose as high as 65% in some locations. In most cases, the sexual um, encounter was a passing phase or occurred when substitutes for heterosexual human relationships were unavailable. Nevertheless, Kingsey admitted that strong emotional ties could develop between farm boys and their animal lovers. There were even men who were quite upset emotionally when situations forced them to sever connections with a particular animal. Now, faced with the absence of reliable data, and there's lots of questions around Kingsley's data. Many commentators simply make assertions based on personal impressions, therapeutic orientation, and of course, political agenda. In the 21st century, for example, anecdotal reports include claims by sex therapists that urban clients were increasingly speaking about engaging in sexual activities with their pets. They speculated that this was due to the isolating effect of internet use. 
loneliness, fear of face-to-face -face human intimacy. Other commentators simply make unsubstantiated claims that bestiality is not uncommon in some districts and under certain circumstances, but no evidence is provided. What we can observe though, is a change in the way these people are spoken about. They are wicked, sinful, immoral, cast down from their elevated position at the crown of God's creation. But from the late 19th century, suddenly they become insane bestiality was being medicalized. The most influential commentator driving this change was Austro-German forensic psychiatrist Richard von Kraft Ebbing, whose Psychopathia Sexualis was first published in 1886, followed by an English translation 10 years later. And it's, you know, it's very difficult to um, overstate the importance of this book. Between its publication and Kraft Ebbing's death in 1904, Psychopathia Sexualis went through 12 editions. What Kraft Ebbing did was he turned bestiality into zoophilia. And this was, he regarded this as kind of a fetish which involved a longing for animals, but also a pathological form of sexual desire. Through a series of case studies, Kraft Ebbing portrayed people who engaged in sexual acts with animals as profoundly unpleasant personalities. According to him, they possessed a heavy taint and was suffering from a constitutional neurosis, which made them impotent for the normal act. They were atavistic throwbacks to an earlier evolutionary stage of life. In other words, bestialists for crap ebbing were degenerates. They were vicious. A typical bestius, according to Kraft Ebbing, was a man whose unmarried mother was deeply tainted and hysterical epileptic. The patient's deformed asymmetrical cranium and deformity and asymmetry of the bones of the face were proof of psychic degeneration. And he was a masturbator and an abuser of animals since his early youth. In short, the bestialist was a human monster. With the growing institutionalization and ideological power of psychiatry and particularly its forensic branch, people who had sex with non-human animals were being diagnosed with psychiatric disorders. A formidable range of psychiatrists began publishing research purporting to show that bestialists and zoophilics were not only mentally ill, but also the most deviant of all deviants. From the late 20th century, though, this argument, this rhetoric was being increasingly undermined. Crucially, researchers from the same disciplines that had been responsible for the pathologization of bestialists, that is psychiatrists, sexologists, and sociologists, began revising their views. Rather than basing their assessments on men incarcerated in high security prisons or psychiatric hospitals, which is where um, these other psychiatrists got their data from, um, they met with zoophilics and began actively engaging with members of newly established so-called zoo communities. To their own surprise, many of these researchers found themselves in sympathy with the people they met. They interviewed zoos, they conducted surveys. So who were the zoos? Well, not surprising here, most turned out to be white Europeans or Americans. They ranged an age between 19 and 78, but an average age in the mid to late 30s. Half were college graduates, 
It was notable that they did not seem to be particularly exceptional in terms of personality. Furthermore, nearly three quarters of zoophilics, according to one survey, simply didn't see anything wrong in having sex with animals. Now, I don't have time in this really brief introduction to talk about zoos and their supporters. A, a chapter in the book is devoted to them. But they increasingly argued that zoophilia was a sexual orientation rather than a perversion. This process was helped immeasurably by the establishment of safe online forums where zoos could communicate with like-minded men and women. So in other words, the internet proved to be crucial, not only in establishing a zoo identity, but also in sharing information and discussing questions of animal consent. Of course, the zoophiles who attracted the attention of these sexologists, sociologists, and um, psychologists are not representative of people who have sex with animals. Their samples, in other words, were just as skewed as their predecessors' ones who focused on prisons and asylum populations. Members of zoophilic communities were likely to be older, more highly educated, and with a stronger orientation towards community than other people who have sex with animals. They are more likely to value animals and therefore more concerned with arguments about and evidence for consent and pleasure. The remarkable similarities in the arguments zoosexuals use to bolster their orientations and practices also I'd like to suggest, um, shows a considerable degree of learned advocacy. Furthermore, it's important to remember that nearly all bestialists and zoophilics treat their sexual partners as of no intrinsic value or worth. Even if not involving obvious coercion or abuse, zoo practices often view the animal as an object like any other desirable sex play object, such as a dildo or handcuffs. Many admit that they regard animals as simply more cooperative or convenient than human partners. They also go to great lengths to groom their animal sexual partners. Furthermore, 21st century zoo identities tend to be framed within a rather conservative discourse of sexuality. Ironically, the movement is often socially traditionalist. Monogamy, romantic love, and partnerships are highly valued, at least in rhetoric. But what if there is another model for loving animals, one that's not violent, not patho pathological, not based on identity politics? Well, I think a hint of this can be found in the life and writings of J.R. Joe Ackerley, a prominent British author and editor in the first half of the 20th century. Ackerley lived with Queenie in a small flat overlooking the London Thames River. Queenie was an Alsatian bitch, and Ackerley was madly in love with her. In order to protect her privacy, Ackley anonymized Queen, Queenie's name in his book-long homage to her, entitled My Dog Tulip, 1965. He insisted that the only training I ever gave Queenie was to set her free. After all, he wrote, I did not want a performing dog, I did not want an obedient dog, I did not want a lead dog, and I did not want to hurt my dog. I wanted a dog of character, not a slave. I wanted to see Queenie's full personality. Animals have different character, have individual characters like ourselves. I wanted Queenie to develop hers and character, I believe, can be developed only in an atmosphere of freedom. He admitted that when they were apart, he sang with joy at the thought of seeing her. Their affection was reciprocal. Ackerley recognized Queenie's agency 
unhooking that concept from human ideas about will, intentionality, and consciousness. He maintained that on the first day they met, he was conscious of being wooed by the most beautiful dog in the world. It was difficult to resist, and she had her way in the end. And he spends a lot of his book describing the beauties of our Queenie, and particularly Queenie's unique personality. Now, admittedly, some aspects of her temperament exacerbated uh, our accolade. But what could he expect? After all, Queenie possessed a clear sense of her own agency, and she too has her feelings. As in all relationships, misunderstandings occurred. Usually, he admits, this was Ackerley's fault for failing to listen carefully enough to her, his partner, even though by her body language and general comportment, Queenie spoke to me as plainly as she could. Ackerley was also bewildered by the way Queenie's behavior changed when other people were present. A shrewd vet informed him that she's in love with you. I expect she's a bit jealous. Dogs aren't difficult to understand. One has to put oneself in their position. Despite occasional squabbles and mix-ups, the relationship between Ackerley and Queenie evolved mutual care, respect, and sensual enjoyment. Quite simply, they loved each other. But are ascribing emotions to a dog a form of anthropomorphism? Is love between different species even possible? Crucially, how can we know? Clearly, animals have complex sensual lives. Too much of the literature on non-human animals, particularly in the utilitarian tradition, focuses on their vulnerability and pain. But animals also experience pleasure. This is the theme of Jonathan Balcombe's book called Pleasurable Kingdom, Animals and the Nature of Feeling Good. He points out that all vertebrates have five basic senses and can experience things such as satisfaction, comfort, joy, bliss. While most Western-based scientists who study the sexuality of animals concentrate on matters such as natural selection, reproduction, it's important to observe that animals also enjoy sex play, deliberately seeking it out. In human terms, many animals a, are polysexual. Both wild and domesticated animals have sexual intercourse with different species to their own. Many relish being caressed and rubbed. Their games often have nothing to do with procreation. Animals masturbate. Female members of certain species have clitorises and engage in genital rubbing and copulation outside of breeding seasons. Some enjoy libidinal encounters with members of their own sex. Many have bodies that are very similar to ours. And while it would be mistaken, as well as anthropomorphic, to infer psychic states like desire to them, it is, I think, not unreasonable to assume that they too respond in positive ways to pleasurable and libidinal sensations. It is one thing to observe that animals enjoy their own and others' bodies, quite another to ask how people can correctly identify and interpret such feelings. Put another way, can we ever know how another creature, whether human or non-human, feels. The vet's shrewd advice to Ackerley, put oneself in their position, points to this long-standing debate. By their very nature, mental states are subjective. Wishes, desires, and preferences are internal, invisible. Is the other always an enigma? To get my views on these questions, you're going to have to buy the book. Suffice to say here that I do argue that queer theory can actually help us understand interspecies erotics. 
Now, the concept of queer has, of course, many, many meaning, meanings. It used to refer to individuals or behaviors designated strange, even weird. From the 1970s onwards, however, the concept was embraced by the gay movement to refer in positive ways to themselves. LGBTQ identities celebrated their difference from heteronormativity. Queer theorists have gone even further, deconstructing and rejecting binaries such as heterosexual, homosexual, masculine, feminine, mind, body, reason, emotion, culture, nature, human, animal. They resist the dominant culture's accusation that queer people are unnatural, perverted, and offensive. They valorize difference. A queer theorist such as Eve Segwick laments the cultural practice of sorting people into kinds and applauds the, um, applauds the openness of queer definitions. Queer cross-species love, therefore, can be seen as a further repudiation of attempts to insist on constrained sexualities. But its radical anti-essentialism also sits uneasily with the zoo's demands for rights and their insistence on identity politics. Z or post-human love is the most disruptive of the queers. Queenie was Ackley's intimate companion for more than 15 years. When she died on the 30th of October 1961, Ackley confessed that it was simply the saddest day of my life. I shall never stop missing her. For people like Ackley who love animals and pay careful attention to their needs and preferences, the queerness of a companion species libidinal responses can spill into human, non-human relationships. It does, however, and this is crucial, it does require a very different conception of sexuality, specifically one that is neither phallologocentric nor anthropocentric. A phallogolocentric model of sexuality with its emphasis on penetration, on force, on nature, always harms animals. An anthropocentric one always confuses them. The love of animals is best situated within the promises offered by queerness. Although notoriously fragmented and difficult to pin down, the queer movement is a celebration of formerly transgressive desires. It attempts to push the boundaries of what is natural and normal. By denaturalizing or queering the animal, or more correctly, companion species, we can take seriously the argument that animals are not simply objects in nature, but historical actors in their own right. They are neither symbols nor metaphors. The complexities of their lives is awe-inspiring, as are their sensual needs, desires, and preferences. There is a need, in other words, to emphasize not only the risks of harm to animals, but also their need for affection, companionship, pleasure. Happiness is morally relevant. There are no limits to erotic creativity. And I think we can all imagine ways of being companionate with an animal, a form of trans-species connectedness. Both human and non-human animals experience the world through encounters, collaborations, conflicts, and bonds of affection. As I discussed throughout this book, the main way humans interact with animals, including companion species, is violent, thoughtless, zoocidal. But it doesn't have to be that way. In the words of the philosophers Sue Donaldson and Will Kim Licker in a wonderful book called Zoopolis, a Political Theory of Animal Rights, the first thing humans must do is recognize that animals are trying to communicate. We must then be attentive to individual 
our repertoires, such as vocalizations and gestures, before responding appropriately. In other words, it's a dialogic, co-created exchange, since the animals in our lives must know that attempts to communicate with us are not wasted effort. As a result, interspecies relationships can be complex, rich, and fulfilling. Love, that most intimate and vulnerable emotion, is itself a coup de foudre, it's ungovernable. But being open to otherness, we might finally find ourselves edging towards becoming true companion species. I hope you enjoy the book.